This video is supported by CuriosityStream. Spaceflight is one of the most inspirational things we do as a species. It brings out some of our absolute best qualities, the drive to explore, to push boundaries, to learn things. It does have a bit of a dark history though. The earliest rockets were weapons of war. ICBMs that could go up above radar and come down over civilian populations. The V-2 rocket from Germany in World War II was one of the most terrifying aspects of that war. Which is why the US and Soviet Union bent all kinds of rules to help out the Nazi rocket designers. So what did you do for the Nazi party? Eh, murdered thousands of Jewish people and gypsies and homosexuals and basically committed genocide to preserve the master Aryan race. So you're just a Nazi scumbag that should be strung up in the street like a dog according to international law. Yes, that's me. Oh, and I worked on rockets too. Really? Who hasn't done that other stuff, right? The space race of the 60s and 70s was amazing and it produced some of the most incredible technological and engineering feats ever in human history, but it was never really about space exploration and the search for knowledge and that kind of thing. It was always more of a dick measuring contest between the US and the USSR. It was always half politics, half science. Which is why the European Space Agency stands out. Their founding document that was signed by ESA members in 1975 promised that all of their missions would be for exclusively peaceful purposes. A mission statement that's remained unchanged throughout all the revisions to their convention over the years. With the success of SpaceX and other private companies ushering in a whole new phase of space travel, the ESA shows what can happen when humanitarian goals meet scientific purpose. This is the space agency Gene Roddenberry might have created. ESA got its start as two different agencies, the ESRO and the ELDO. ESRO stands for European Space Research Organization. ELDO is the European Launch Development Organization. Basically, ESRO designed satellites and ELDO uh, designed the rockets that flew them up into space. One of the ESA's first projects was Space Lab, a science laboratory that fit in the cargo bay of the space shuttle. In addition to overseeing construction, they negotiated to send some of their first astronauts up to the space shuttle to work on this thing in exchange for about a billion dollars in funds and equipment. The Challenger disaster of 1986 was, of course, a huge tragedy and grounded the shuttle fleet for years to come, but the ESA sort of benefited from this because they were able to take out the slack in the commercial launch segment with their Ariane series of rockets. After an unsuccessful rocket program named Europa, the first Ariane rocket took off in 1979 and has seen five different versions over the years in various configurations, sometimes with solid strap-on boosters with a cryogenic main stage powered by a Vulcan 2 engine. The current model, the Ariane 5, has two massive solid rocket boosters that get dumped in the ocean after launch. It's been in regular use since 1996 with a remarkable 95% success rate. Which is pretty great considering that the first launch of the Ariane 5 resulted in uh, a little too much boom. The whole thing came down to a programming conversion error that basically caused a glitch in the software and caused the whole thing to blow up. It's actually become kind of famous amongst programmers as one of the most expensive coding mistakes in history. But it's been much better since then. So that's good. The Ariane is actually built by an ESA spin-off company called Ariane Space, which basically dominated the commercial market in the 80s and 90s, and it's, it's still a pretty major player. In fact, more than half of all the telecom satellites currently in use were launched by Ariane Space. The Ariane is a beautiful and much more importantly reliable launch vehicle that has done just about everything from sending cargo up to the ISS to commercial satellite launches to interplanetary probes. What it is not is reusable. They haven't gotten on the reusability train. They still dump the entire ship into the ocean. The ocean, right off of their launch facility in French Guiana in South America, cleverly named the Guiana Space Center, or the Special Centre de Guianis, or Guiani. I don't speak French. All I know is you only pronounce like 10% of the consonant sounds. So I guess it's actually Centre Spaghetti. The Space Center is just north of the town of Kourou and has multiple launch areas and assembly buildings, not just for ESA and Ariane space, but also for Soyuz rockets for Roscosmos. And it's actually one of the best launch locations in the world because it's so close to the equator, which actually gives rockets a little bit of extra momentum for equatorial orbit. The reason that matters is because the Earth rotates to the east at 1600 kilometers per hour, which is why from our perspective, the sun travels from east to west. And the closer you get to the equator, the faster you're traveling. So the closer you can launch to the equator, the more momentum you have to get into orbit right off the bat. And when it comes to the rocket equation, every bit helps. 
Since debuting the Ariane 5, ESA has actually worked on a lot of really cool missions. One of the biggest wins for ESA and one of the most fascinating projects they worked on was the Rosetta mission where they actually landed their lander Philae on a comet. This is the first time that's ever been done. Ariane 5 has also launched the Herschel Telescope and the Planck Observatory, which mapped the CMB of the universe. And just over a month ago, the ESA launched one of the most exciting missions in probably about a decade, the Bepi Colombo mission to Mercury. Bepi Colombo is named after Giuseppe Colombo, who went by Bepi to his friends. He was a math genius who calculated the trajectory of the Mariner 10 spacecraft between Venus and Mercury. Which is appropriate because the mission named in his honor will fly an insanely complicated path to get to Mercury that will take over seven years and involve no fewer than nine flybys intended to slow its speed, including six different flybys of Mercury itself before settling into orbit in December of 2025. 2025? That's, that's not even a real year. Come on. It has to do this because, ironically, it's actually harder to fly toward the Sun than away from it, especially if you have to enter orbit around Mercury because Mercury's gravity is so weak compared to that of the Sun that if you don't slow down and get things just right, you'll fall into the Sun's gravity well, and that's not a good thing. Once there, it'll actually release two satellites, the MEO from JAXA, who I actually covered in a previous video, and the MPO, the Mercury Planetary Orbiter, that was developed by the ESA. Now both of these spacecraft are loaded to the gills with instruments to observe the composition and the geography of the planet, but they're also designed to work together to map out the magnetic field. MEO will actually float inside of the magnetic field, MPO will be outside of it, and together they're going to map how the magnetic field interacts with the solar wind. Now once in orbit, the two spacecraft should have a lifespan of around 5 to 10 years, which means that it should probably come to a conclusion sometime around 2035. And they actually got started working on this in the year 2000, so this is altogether a 35-year project that cost over $2 billion or just slightly more than the average James Cameron film. All of this to study Mercury. I mean, no offense to any Mercury lovers out there, but Mercury? Really? Well, it turns out there's a lot we can learn from Mercury in terms of how rocky planets form so close to stars. Yeah, so over the last 20 years, we've discovered now thousands of exoplanets and planetary systems around stars in our galaxy. And what we're starting to find out is that we're kind of the weird one. You know that feeling when you think you're normal and then you look around and you kind of realize you're actually the oddball? Yeah, we're, we're kind of going through that as a species right now. By the way, if you've never had that feeling, you're in denial. Weirdo. So our solar system has four rocky planets that orbit pretty close to the sun and they're fairly evenly spaced out. And then beyond that, there are these huge gas giants that are much further spread out. And that sort of makes sense when you think about it because, you know, gas you think would be further away and the rocky, the denser, more heavy uh, rocky material would coalesce closer to the sun. So we assume that's normal and that we would see that in other solar systems as well. Turns out, uh, no. Most of the planetary systems that we've observed actually don't follow this pattern. The planets are much more closely related in size and they're much more evenly spread out. So this really makes us rethink exactly how solar systems form. And studying Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun, can help shed some light on how our solar system is made and why we're just so flinging, flinging weird. And also learning more about Mercury's magnetic field can help us to understand a little bit better how magnetic fields work. It's the most obvious thing I've ever said in my life. Not every planet has a magnetic field. In fact, Mercury and Earth are the only two rocky planets that do. Venus and Mars don't. And a magnetic field is crucial for life because it keeps us safe from cosmic rays and helps to keep the atmosphere from being, you know, kind of flayed away by solar wind. So understanding how Mercury's magnetic field works could help us to find other planets out there that could contain life, or are suitable for life anyway. And it could possibly spur on some ideas for how to protect astronauts on interplanetary travel and on extraterrestrial colonies. Honestly, we don't really even know what kind of discoveries we'll make with Bippy Colombo, but that's how science works. You go out there and you do pure science and you find stuff, you never know where it could lead. So Bippy Colombo, it's a big deal, but some of ESA's future projects coming up are just as exciting. The biggest project on the horizon is the James Webb Space Telescope, which is actually set to be launched on the Ariane 5 rocket sometime around the year million. Actually, the current launch date of the James Webb Space Telescope is March 30th of 2021, but as I have described in another video, that could change by the time I finish saying this sentence. But before the James Webb goes up, they've actually got another project coming up called Biomass that's going to measure and map all the forests on the planet. 
And they'll also launch a solar orbiter that's supposed to complement the Parker Solar Probe. And in June of 2022, they plan to send JUICE, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, on a trip to Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa, which is really exciting. The Jovian system is one of the most interesting things in the solar system. In the meantime, they'll continue being a regular launch provider for commercial satellites, even though they've taken a huge hit from SpaceX lately. Yeah, once upon a time, the ESA and Roscosmos had the uh, commercial segment pretty much locked up, but SpaceX has kind of been eating their lunch with the Falcon 9. Which is why in 2020, the ESA is going to debut their Ariane 6 rocket, which is still not renewable, but it's incredibly efficient and is gonna get the cost down to $95 million a launch. So very competitive with SpaceX. But that's cool, competition is a good thing. It spurs innovation and ESA is stepping up to the plate. And let's hope that they succeed because honestly, to me, the ESA is the very definition of what space travel should be all about. Just nothing but pure science, pure exploration. The ESA started as an effort between 10 different countries. Now it's expanded out to 22, all in a common cause, to expand human knowledge and improve human life. So viva la exploration spatial. Nailed it. If the exploration of space and the quest for scientific knowledge gets you all tingly inside, which if it doesn't, I don't know why you're watching this channel, then you might be interested in today's sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a repository for some of the best award-winning documentaries and programs you can find online and subjects from history, nature, technology, society, and more. If you want to dip your toes into the sweet, sweet Curiosity Stream goodness, you might want to start with Destination Mars, which compares the NASA and Chinese plans to visit and colonize Mars, along with the Netherlands-based Mars One program. And that's just one of their documentary programs. They have it on every single subject you can think of. It's just binge watchable, it's amazing. If you like to watch documentaries and learn stuff, you really ought to check out Curiosity Stream. It's pretty cool. And you can get a 30 day free trial of Curiosity Stream if you go to the link down in the description, curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott. 30 day free trial, what do you got to lose? Go binge watch your mind blow, curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott, links down in the description. Thanks to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this video and a big huge thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon. They're just awesome people informing a community. I love it. And we've got so many new people that have joined. This is just a small percentage of them. I will get to the rest. Let me just murder some names real quick. We've got Harry Potensky, uh, Luis Onsuarez, Dave Wally, Alan Millar, <laughs> Gregory Robotham, Walter D. Haugus, James Piver, Tamir, Dylan Grosvenor, Alejandro Mari, Deborah Taylor, Darren Williams, Just Danielle, Christelle Brewer, Amanda J. Smith, David Fortney, Ivan Ganev, Sean Devine, Robert Smith, Jeremy Sartori, Ed Kotzevich, uh, Russell Mellon, Simon Bonaire, Carol Powell, Brian Makepeace, and Talis of Miletus. I think I said that right. Uh, thank you guys so much. I'm so glad to have you. And if you would like to join them, get early access to videos and access to me as a person, then you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video. Google thinks you'll like that. And if you do, maybe subscribe and hit the bell and you'll be notified when I put out new videos every Monday and every Thursday. Also, the holidays are coming up. We got merch, we got some cool shirts. This is actually a new one. I haven't worn this one before. Uh, you can go to answerswithjoe.com slash shirts and see we got dozens of them on there. They're designed by this really cool dude in Prague uh, at sfsf.com, sort of a collaboration there. So go check those out and get some cool Christmas gifts. All right, enough of all that. Thank you guys so much for watching again. Please go out now, have an eye-opening week and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.